Hey, hello, and welcome or welcome back. I suppose you may notice that I'm doing this video a little bit different. I wanted to be able to focus on my makeup look a little more than I usually would because I usually just do pretty standard makeup, you know, just what I would maybe do every day. But I'm doing this a bit differently. I am copying off of one of the cover art pieces from this book. I'm sorry, I'm currently being bothered by my cat. So, hello. Hello Zelda, my beautiful girl. She's also read this book, as you will see here. She's currently rubbing her head all over it while I hold it, while I try and do my voiceovers. You can't eat the bookmarks. Thank you. No. Have another one. You can play with that. Right. Back to it. So, first up, we're talking about Eat the Rich. But get off. First up, I'm taking it off you. And you can play with this. First up, we have Eat the Rich by Sarah Gailey, Pius Back, Roman Titov, with some extra cover artwork by Kevin Tong. This is basically about a girl called Joey, who is planning on meeting her boyfriend's family over the summer. And she discovers that this ridiculously rich family has a very dark secret when it comes to the way they treat their staff. And honestly, often when I read graphic novels, comic book volumes, I believe this is a graphic novel, not a volume, I... Lily's on some bullshit now as well. Brilliant. She just shoved her feet under the rug and then made a weird little bird sound and ran into the kitchen. So this is going to be interesting to say the least. So often when I'm reading comic volumes, graphic novels, that sort of thing, while I enjoy them, I'm often not super roped in by in the same way I am with regular novels don't know what it is even with short story collections I'm usually a bit more involved but I don't know what it is I'm usually like the art's great the story's great but I'm not incredibly roped in obviously the big exception to that this year has been with reading Junji Ito and I will say with this this is one of the best graphic novels I have read this year not just this year, it is just one of the best that I've read, it is, it just, it deals with political issues brilliantly, it is not, if you can hear scratching sounds, again, it is Lily being odd, um, it deals with, like, socio-political issues really well, remaining with, like, a bleak sense of humour, but it at no point feels like you're going, oh god, this is like reminding me too much of real life, it's making me depressed, it, it, if anything, it's sort of one of those go out there, do something kind of feeling. I mean, ob obviously the artwork in here is wonderful, Damn, the colouring I think is probably what I enjoy most about this, the way colour is played with throughout. Uh, there's just these little hints of things. I just, oh, I'm not very good at talking about graphic novels the way I am with regular stuff, I guess, but I'm being stared at by Zelda. This is, I'm never usually this distracted because I usually sit and film upstairs. I don't usually just talk and I'm not looking at my camera. I'm just doing voiceover, which is very unusual for me. If I do this again, um, apart from with this video, it will be hopefully a bit more smooth. But yeah, the way things are 
led into, I think, is what I really like. Like, the, she's apprehensive to meet the family. Oh, it's because the family's rich. And then it becomes a bit clear that it's like, oh, they're like, rich, rich. They're like, don't talk to the help. Because, what are you doing down there? Don't talk to the help. You know, and you have to be the proper kind of girl for uh, this rich family's son that she's in a relationship with. And it it's already like, oh, these people are foul from the start. And then she meets one of the members of staff there, I believe she is a nanny. And she's... The nanny's usually really standoffish at first because it's like, you shouldn't be talking to me, you're going to get yourself into trouble. But, over the course of the... Fucking hell! Oi! What's wrong with you? Calm down. <laughs> over the course of the book, their relationship grows stronger you can see there's a real bond between the two of them um effectively she finds out joey our protagonist she finds out that this rich family hires their staff by finding people who are in desperate need of help mostly monetarily and then make them sign a contract which means that they get but you don't find out about the contract stuff until a bit later on. But it, it's fine for me to talk about this. Basically, they sign a contract, which means they know they're going to die at the end. And they don't just die. They get sacrificed, essentially, once they retire. And then their remains become meat. And the way they're like effectively addicted to this meat and if you don't keep eating it you will starve and it's just like oh it's so rancid and there's a you know big question of okay but if you know this is going to happen why would you sign that contract and that's spoken about both in the novel and afterwards uh, one of the writers speaks about that in a bit of a an afterword uh, that would be Sarah Gailey that talks about that. And basically talking about how if you are that desperate for money, yeah, of course you're going to do that anyway. You know, you've got Petal, the nanny, who has a myriad of health issues, mostly stemming from having lupus. And, you know, she can get all of her medical bills cared for. She was basically not going to make it anyway had she not signed this contract therefore if she's gonna die why not right the first person that gets killed you know he had a son that i think they said it was cancer he was able to get his son's medical care paid for because his family would just throw money at their staff and it is just such a good story been talking about like because there's always that thing of like oh but if you disagree with this system why do you participate in it it's like because i don't have a choice i am living in this system because i need to eat i need to live i need to survive but i do what i can to live ethically now in this case it's not necessarily about i do what i can to live ethically it's i do what i can to live long enough to live a good life the staff here are going to be doing more than just surviving they're going to live a decent life until the point where they retire and at the point of retirement they then become a meal and just the way that the family is spoken about sorry the way the family is portrayed is so good because they're so repulsive so 
the mother, she talks to Joey and she's like, I know that you've seen what we do here, but it's just tradition. And I was repulsed by it when I first saw it, but I got used to it. It's like, yeah, you got used to it because you really like the lifestyle. And yes, also because if you stop eating the meat, the issues occur. But you know what's happening and you are no longer repulsed by it. You have allowed yourself to become a part of this because you want the ultimate rich lifestyle. Like 1% rich lifestyle. Taylor Swift CO2 emissions kind of lifestyle, right? Because that's all that's important to her. Whereas Joey, with some morals, it's different for her. She never goes, you know what, you're right, I will live this life. She doesn't want to, not one bit. And from start to finish, she is repulsed by it. And it becomes a case of, I don't want to live like them. I will find a way to do it differently or at the very least on my terms. There's no real moral victory at the end of it when it comes to what's happening, but there is a victory in terms of how it happens. And that I am not spoiling because, well, you should read it for yourself. I obviously recommend this book. This is fantastic. I got it from my local library and I have a feeling that I will be picking up a copy for myself when I can because this is phenomenal. We have a couple of other books by, particularly by Sarah Gailey, who's the writer here. Um, which I may be picking up at some point. So we've got The Echo Wife and Magic for Liars. I will be looking them up, seeing if, at the very least, seeing if I can find them at my library because that is where I get most of my graphic novels from, just because they have a pretty good collection there. So I will, I'd say I'll see you all shortly. I will see you in a couple of seconds. But I have other things to do right now so it'll be a lot longer until I see you again so next up we have Save Yourself by Bones Leopard and Kelly and Nicole Matthews this one is probably going to be the shortest part of this review mostly because this is pretty standard for the way I um, with, like I said, with comic volumes, graphic novels, as I said with the first part of this, we're talking about Eat the Rich, where I was like, usually I read this sort of thing, and I'm like, yep, that was good, glad I read that, that was fun enough, probably not going to stick with me, that's where I might with this one, it was a bit of cute fun, I read this in the same way that one might watch a superhero movie and I don't mean if you're like heavily invested in them I just mean in that way where it's like oh yeah I feel like chucking something on like yeah I'll just put a Tobey Maguire Spider-Man movie on I'm not heavily invested in it but it's bloody good fun yeah I want to watch Macho Man Randy Savage yell That's what I want. It's very good, it's quite cheesy, and I feel good about having read it. It's definitely, I'd say, aimed more towards teens. It just has that vibe to it, that kind of awkwardness, I would say. It's certainly fun in terms of the way it uses LGBT plus rep we have people with you know a range of pronouns be it you know one of the characters bless you one of the characters bear uses zer pronouns 
and you've got our bless you again we have our protagonist Gigi who is some flavour of queer not 100% sure in fact I believe most of our protagonists are some flavour of queer so that's always fun and yeah it's very much in that kind of very clear that this is by and for LGBT plus people that is not me making assumptions by the way about any of the authors if they are queer or not but it's clear that it is for queer people because there's accuracy in the way that these people are written not least of all because it is a group of queer friends because it you good you okay (laughs) yeah okay so you know you've got a group of friends rather than you've got the one token that you often see and i yeah i I think i particularly do like Gigi's sort of sweet awkwardness it's a little bit like what you'd expect from a awkward teen protagonist both kind of looks wise and the way that she acts and all that I just think it's very it's sweet and it's wholesome and sometimes you just need to pick something up and go this was sweet this was cute I can't say that I will read it again I would read it again you know it's not the sort of thing where I'm like you know against reading it I just thought it was a lot of fun I particularly like the fact that the dialogue is relatively natural in a lot of superhero and that type of uh, graphic novels and comic books and stuff the dialogue does not feel like a real person has ever spoken like this ever it just feels like and this is something that's made it into the film adaptations as well it just feels like quippy one-liner after quippy one-liner and it's like maybe i just want to hear somebody have a chat you know and this does that pretty well it it still has the tone down like it's very clear of what this is but these people they basically do speak like people for the most part like i said this is going to be pretty short i just i thought this was fun cute actually i thought the i haven't spoken much about the art style of it i think the art style is bloody lovely it's got a real softness to it i It's got a, like, painty kind of quality, almost like, um, oh, was it, is it gouache? Is that how you say that? It's a little bit like that, and I really, I really like it. It's really soft, inviting, and you've got, like, warm, bright colours, which I always really like in a lot of the graphic novels that I read. I I tend to not read much that's like cute, fun and happy, so obviously most of the time the colour palettes are not exactly the most warm and inviting, or when they are, it's sort of juxtaposed to what's actually going on, but in this you've got cute, fun colour palettes and art styles and it's all very warm and inviting. And while I did say that this is clearly aimed more at teenagers, I certainly feel like it's one of those things that, yes, this is maybe aimed at somebody a bit younger, but certainly accessible for anyone, really, be it younger than teens, older than teens. I think this is one of those things where it's just like, this is pretty well-rounded. It's not going to feel too simple for an older reader, because sometimes that can happen. But if you are a younger reader, even younger than teen, there's no content in it that would be inappropriate for a younger reader because 
any violence that is present is very comic book style violence and as far as I can recall there's no blood or anything like that so it would be good for a younger reader as well which I always appreciate with uh, books that include LGBT plus rep yeah like I said I can't say I wouldn't read it again I may well look up more by the artists more than the writer in this one just because I would like to paint something perhaps using their kind of style as inspo because I always like to try a bunch of different styles out I always think that's fun but yeah I think it's about time we wrapped up so I hope you have a wonderful day a wonderful night a wonderful whenever you are watching this right